Welcome to the Spiritual Awakening Radio Podcast. My name is James Bean. On today's program, the ascension of the soul through the higher planes, the heavens, sometimes also referred to as realms, inner regions, levels, or spheres. Descriptions of the meditation practice of Sant Mat and of the inner visions, the inner auditions, the inner sounds of the various spheres, making heavy use of the Sarbachan Radhaswami poetry of Swami Ji Maharaj, along with many other sources. Why would souls at the beginning of time choose to leave their perfect paradise and live separate lives incarnating in far distant regions? That is one of the great questions of the ages. Why would the many leave the one and choose to live separate lives? Drops separating from the divine ocean. It almost seems like God has a maternal instinct desires company, wishes to share the journey, wishes to have children. This process of the many leaving the one is described by many masters as cyclical. Thus the many will eventually return back to the one in the end. The prodigal souls will find their way back to the kingdom. No harm done. All shall be well, all shall be well, says Julian of Norwich. All shall be well. The way out is within, according to the masters, a kind of ascension of the soul not outwardly in the physical realm, up in the sky, but an upper ascent that takes place spiritually within the temple of the human body, with eyes closed, gazing into the field of darkness lying in front of us. As Master Kirpal Singh once said, that which sees the darkness without the aid of the physical eyes is the third eye. What may eventually open up for us within are tunnels of light and sound that pass through many inner regions of consciousness. This is the interior voyage of the soul back to the kingdom of heaven. Inner visions may include tunnels of light, seeing various colors, suns, moons, stars, dark voids, and infinitely bright light. Sounds heard during Surit Shabd Yoga practice, inner light and sound meditation. Sounds heard can be similar to that of an eternally ringing bell, a bell sound or tone, a conch shell, thunder, drum beat, violin like sound, flute like sounds, which are the higher types of sounds. When meditating with this nada, inner mystic sound, it is essential that the aspirant always seeks and follows the particular aspect of it that is most subtle and ultra in pitch, as well as in brilliance. Even when the sound becomes very shrill and loud, in moments of deep concentration, he or she must not be tempted to be satisfied with it merely because it is sharp and resonant. The meditator should relentlessly attempt to rise further and further into ever more subtle spheres of its mysterious invisible kingdom. That's a quote from Edward Salim Michael from his book, The Law of Attention, Nada Yoga, and The Way of Inner Vigilance, which has some mystic references to sound that seem quite genuine and authentic. Nada Yoga is another term for inner sound meditation. Nada is very similar in usage in India as the word Shabd or Shabda, Shabd, 
the inner sound, which is part of the Godhead, Logos word, music of the spheres, the part of God that in the beginning created all things, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the Tao, in the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the music of the spheres. Baba Ram Singh. So we should consider ourselves indeed fortunate if we have the pangs of separation of God Almighty and of our Master within, and we follow that path and we do our meditation with love and affection. That way, if we do our meditation daily with love and affection, our mind also becomes purer. The burden of karmas also is lessened and the mind, which is scattered, normally all over the place, also gets focused within, and the attention of the soul gets focused within. That's from one of the satsang discourses of Baba Ram Singh. Sant Mat, the path and teachings as taught and practiced by the saints, the Sant Sat Gurus, or masters, delineates the path of union of the soul with God. The instructions of the saints explain the reuniting as follows. The individual soul has descended from the higher worlds, the realm of the divine, to this city of illusion, bodily existence. It has descended from the soundless state to the essence of sound, from that sound to light, and finally from the realm of light to the kingdom of darkness. The sense organs, qualities, dharmas, natural tendencies, draw us downward and away from our true nature. The nature of the soul or Atman draws us upward and inwards and establishes us in our true nature. Returning to our origins involves turning inward, withdrawal of consciousness from the senses and sense objects, to go upward from darkness to the realms of light and sound. We experience this phenomenon of withdrawal as we pass from waking consciousness to deep sleep. Another way to express this is to go inward from the external sense organs to the depth of the inner self. The natural tendencies of the soul or Atman are to move from outward to inward. The current of consciousness which is dispersed in the nine gates of the body and the senses must be collected at the tenth gate. The tenth gate is the gathering point of consciousness. Therein lies the path for our return. The tenth gate is also known as the sixth chakra, the third eye, the center located between the two eyebrows. This is the gateway through which we leave the sense organ gates and enter the divine realms and finally become established in the soul. We travel back from the realm of darkness to the realm of light, the light to the divine sound, and the realm of sound to the soundless state. This is called turning back to the source. That is on the goal of Sant Mat meditation from the book Harmony of All Religions by Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj in the lineage of Maharishi Mehi, Baba Devi Sahib, and Paramsant Tulsi Sahib. The world has never been without a living master. Beneath all other impelling forces in the creation, spirituality is the primary cause. That and that alone is the driving force that always leaps up to join its source. In every living being, from tiny plant up to humanity, the spiritual flame of life is struggling upward and onward towards its source of being. And this process 
and this struggle must go on until the last speck of dust returns to the central fires of infinite being. The message of the masters fills the world with hope and at the same time it offers a rational foundation for such hope. It not only tells people what they should do, but it offers them a definite method of doing it. In the march of the ages, cycle after cycle, in every planet where human beings reside, the great masters are the light bearers of that world. Until the end of the ages, they will remain the friends and saviors of those who struggle toward the light. A passage from the book Path of the Masters by Julian P. Johnson. This path of the masters is a mystic path, a living school of spirituality, which shares some things in common with the world religions, but also diverges from mainstream religion, which tends to look back in time to past scriptures by people who are no longer living. And so there is this focus on looking to the past, not to the present. And there's a sense of Heaven is in the future, spirituality is in the by and by, not right here, right now. So there is a lack of awareness, a lack of perception, a lack of spiritual seeing and hearing in the present, but prophecies and stories about great things happening someday in another place and another time. For the mystic soul, that place and that time is right here and right now. Gospel of Thomas, saying 51, His disciples said to him, When will the resurrection of the dead take place? And when will the new world come? He said to them, That which you are awaiting has already come, but you do not recognize it. Gospel of Thomas, saying 49, Blessed are those chosen and unified. The realm of the kingdom is theirs. For out of her you have come, and back to her you are returning. There are also references in the Gospel of Thomas to the soul coming from the light, and that the soul is going to return back to the light again. Gospel of Thomas saying 17, the initiation saying, The Master said, I shall give you what no eye has seen, and what no ear has heard, what no hand has touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. And this is from another similar text called Dialogue of the Savior from the Nag Hammadi Library. When I arrived, I opened a path and taught people about the way of passage for those who are chosen and solitary who have known the Father and pursued truth, saying of Yeshua, Gospel of the Savior. Initiation takes place by a living master in the here and now, revealing the secrets of spiritual practice in order to re-enter into the kingdom of the heavens, not in the by and by in an abstract theoretical sort of way, but in a practical sort of way, here now, today, those who purify should bestow upon others from their own abundance of purity. Those who illuminate as possessing more luminous intelligence, duly receiving and again shedding forth the light and joyously filled with the holy brightness should impart their own overflowing light to those worthy of it. Finally, those who make perfect, being skilled in the mystical participations, should lead to that consummation those who are perfected by the most holy initiation of the knowledge of holy things which they have contemplated. That's from Dionysus, from a book called The Celestial Hierarchy on the Initiation. Those who experience the divine light, 
those who are fluent in it are the embodiment of that spiritual mystery, share it with others and bring them into initiation into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. This detailed and more comprehensive account of the kingdom of God is true. It is for the exclusive use and guidance of the good and sincere souls who wish to improve their spiritual vision and explore the light of the kingdom of God. It is for those who are not satisfied with the blind captivity of their souls in this perishable cage that these few hints are given to enable them to realize the spiritual path that is hidden from their physical eyes. Swami Ram Bahari Lal from a spiritual classic called The Way Out Is In in the Radha Swami tradition. Bahari Lal was a disciple of Sant Garab Das, who in turn was a disciple and spiritual successor of Swami Ji Maharaj of Agra. At the time of initiation by a living master, one is shared about, one is imparted or one is taught, one is given the instructions about meditation practice. Surit Shabad Yoga, inner light and sound meditation, the various techniques. These names, the five names, sacred names, instructions about light and sound are not to be found online or in books, but is between the master and their students on a need to know basis. So that those given instruction are given complete instruction in doing the practice properly and are not only mentored, but there's a subtle spiritual influence between master and disciple that brings the disciple into the experience of the inner light and sound. It's not just limited to intellectual information being imparted. In the true terminology of the saints or masters, a blind man is defined not as one who has no eyes in his head, but as one whose inner eye is closed. Those who do not see the light of God are all, excuse me, blind. When they come to a master and he gives them a sitting, the inner eye is opened and they see the light of God. When they return, they are men with the inner eye opened. Similarly, before going to a master, a man is deaf. When the master gives him a sitting, he begins to hear the music of the spheres and he becomes aware. That's Kripal Singh from the book God Power, Christ Power, Master Power on the process of initiation from a living master and their students. Their students are brought into the experience of inner light and sound meditation at the time of their initiation. Kripal Singh Spiritual Elixir, excerpts from his letter to initiates, his uh, letters to initiates. Mind has to be stilled, eyes have to be closed from all external views, and the ears likewise from all outer sounds. The soul currents of the body have to be withdrawn and collected at one center, the seat of the soul in the body, the third eye center. And this is done according to the instructions given at the time of initiation. This, in brief, is what is called spirituality, the proper type of meditation, the science of Paravidya, which has come down from ancient times and is known today as Sant Mat. Kirpal Singh I want you to learn spiritual knowledge. Then you must go to a spiritually competent teacher. The appropriate spiritual teacher should be a person who has considered and discovered the realities of Atma, spirit and matter, bondage and liberation, and whose practices, or, or rather, and who practices a spiritual path. Such a teacher should have attained direct experience of truth through spiritual disciplines. This is the teacher you should take instructions from. 
The grace of the teacher is also necessary for success in spiritual pursuit. When you learn the methods for inner meditation, you should practice diligently. Moral rectitude is also very essential in this pursuit. A passage from Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj on seeking not just a spiritual teacher, but a competent spiritual teacher. Someone who not only knows the theory of meditation practice, but is the living embodiment of it. They don't just talk about light and sound, they actually are fluent in the experience of all the inner regions of which they talk about and describe and write about. And this is an amazing passage from Shahai Swami, another successor of Maharishi Mehi Paramahans, on how amazing this path is. God is perceivable only through the soul, but our individual soul has become surrounded or covered by several sheaths or subtle bodies, astral, causal, and so on. So long as it remains in the captivity of these various subtle bodies and the physical body, it will be under the knowledge of these bodies and organs only, will be under illusory knowledge only, and will not be able to realize God. In order to know God, the Jiva Atma, the soul, the individual soul, shall have to liberate itself from these bondages. The one who is able to liberate himself from the body and subtle bodies is able to lift himself beyond the universe also, says Shahai Swami. The subtle bodies are associated with inner regions, astral body, astral plane, causal body, causal plane, mental body, mental plane, and so on. So once you shed those and are a spirit, you, you go to you say to yourself, I am that, I am that, I am a soul, and you find yourself in the spiritual realm, you are beyond all of these subtle bodies and lower planes. So transcending the subtle bodies, astral, causal, and so on, is at the same time transcending those planes, astral plane, causal plane, mental plane, etc. In due time, if the process is complete, the individual spirit current or substance is slowly withdrawn from the body. Eventually, he is able to pierce the veil that intervenes, which in reality is not thicker than the wing of a butterfly. And then he opens what is called the tenth door and steps out into a new world. The body remains in the position in which he left it, quite senseless, but unharmed by the process. He is now in a world he never saw before. That's a passage from Julian P. Johnson on the process of meditation. You must be ready to accept the possibility that there is a limitless range of awareness for which we now have no words. That awareness can expand beyond range of your ego, yourself, your familiar identity, beyond everything you have learned, beyond your notions of space and time beyond the differences which usually separate people from each other and from the world around them. A quote from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is called A Peep Inside. When you have controlled your mind a little and have begun to catch the spiritual word or sound internally, you will notice a ray of light in the dark chamber just above the eyes, a little further practice will take you to a sky, light, pale in color, studded with white stars or a blue or cloudy sky. You pierce through this screen, reach the tenth gate of this body and the main entrance. Another glimpse 
of Within from Swami Ram Bahari Lal from the book The Way Out Is In. Picking up on this theme of closing your eyes, focusing at the third eye center and beginning the practice, what you may encounter. Enchanted Land, this is a book by David Christopher Lane from a chapter dedicated to Yogani Mataji, disciple of Baba Fakir Chand. Mataji exuded a sense of joy and happiness. We talked for more than three hours about a variety of subjects, but I was most intrigued with Mataji's experiences on the inner spiritual planes. I asked her what it was like to leave the body. Mataji responded with a beautiful description of how consciousness can be released from the mortal frame by attaching itself to the stream of celestial music radiating from the top of the head and beyond. To do this, she said, one must first be initiated by a genuine mystic who has gained access to the higher realms. The practice itself, although it takes many years to master, sounds relatively simple. The body should be kept perfectly still with one particular posture held for at least three hours. One may choose a cross-legged position, like the yogis in the lotus pose, or a more comfortable posture, relaxed in position in a chair. Keeping the back erect and the mind alert, one continuously repeats God's name, a name or names as given by his or her guru. This Simran, as Mataji termed it, should be done with one's attention centered behind closed eyes. Coupled with this physical stillness and ceaseless repetition of God's name, the next step is to contemplate the light within. At first, Mataji pointed out, there will only be darkness, but eventually light will appear in the form of either small flashes or small star-like points. In any case, one should focus on the radiance, keeping one's Simran intact and allowing the light to draw the soul inward. The third and most important step, Mataji said, is to listen to the sound that issues forth from the light. It is this internal music which will numb the body and allow the consciousness to leave its ordinary dwelling. By riding this current of light and sound like a fish going upstream, the soul will be able to go back to its original home. On the journey within, however, the soul must be guided by a true master so as not to be detained in any of the lower illusory regions. According to Mataji, what near-death patients experience is only the beginning of a vast soul journey into great universes of light, love, and beauty. Personally, I was overcome with the profundity of Mataji's account, although it seemed plausible, especially given the findings of near-death patients who have been resuscitated. The soul's journey in the beginning stages appeared too difficult. How can one sit so still, repeat only holy names, and think of God constantly? By falling in love, Mataji answered serenely. Because when one is truly in love, nothing but the beloved can enter one's mind. So the secret of Surat Shabad Yoga and of mysticism, she goaded, is not necessarily practice and more practice, but love to be so devoted to one's Lord that nothing can stand in the way. This and nothing else is the truth of Sant Mat, Mataji stressed. Enchanted Land is the name of the book that's from, by David Christopher Lane, MSAC Philosophy Group is the publisher. From that same book, Enchanted Land, which not only refers to India with various chapters, 
devoted to different spiritual teachers, but the enchanted land that is within, the temple of the human body. In the realm of darkness, the realm of light that is beyond the darkness, and the realm of sound which emanates from beyond that. Unlike other yogic disciplines in India, such as Kundalini, Surit Shabad Yoga, Inner Light and Sound Meditation, does not advocate breath control, pranayama, or a series of physical postures as part of its practice. Rather, it is concerned with withdrawing consciousness from the nine apertures of the body, eyes, ears, nose, etc., and transcending the corporeal frame and its limitations altogether. This is accomplished by attaching the mind's attention to an inner light and sound which is believed to be radiating behind the proverbial tenth door, the third eye of the Hindus, anatomically located behind and slightly above the physical eyes. When consciousness becomes totally concentrated at this pivotal point between the worlds, the soul, according to the saints in this tradition, leaves the body and experiences in elevating degrees of higher and higher regions of bliss. The distinctive characteristics of Surit Shabad Yoga is its emphasis on listening to the inner sound current known variously as Shabad, Shabda, Nada, or audible life stream. It is through this union of the soul with the primordial music of the universe that the practice derives its name, Surat equals soul. Surat is the attention faculty of the soul. Shabad or Shabda is the sound current. Yoga means union. To be able to achieve a consciously induced NDE, near-death state, takes great effort. Hence, masters of this path emphasize a threefold method designed to still the mind and vacate the body. Simran, Dion, and Bhajan. Simran, the repetition of a holy name or names, draws one's attention to the eye center, keeping thoughts from being scattered too far outside. Such sacred remembrance is similar in form to the use of a mantra or special prayer, except that the names are repeated silently with the mind and not with the tongue. This stage, according to practitioners, is the first and perhaps most difficult leg of meditation. Dion, Dion contemplation within, is a technical pr procedure to hold one's attention at the third eye focus. In the beginning, this may be simply gazing into the darkness or reimagining the guru's form, but it eventually develops into seeing light of various shapes. Out of this light appears the radiant form of one's spiritual master who guides the neophyte on the inner voyage and becomes the central point of Dion. Bhajan means listening to the celestial melody or sound. It is the last and most important part of Surat Shabad Yoga because it is the vehicle by which the meditation can be extended. The meditator can traverse to exalted planes of awareness. Whereas Simran withdraws and Dion holds the mind's attention, it is Bhajan which takes awareness on its upward ascent back to the supreme abode, Sach Khand, the true eternal realm, above astral, causal, mental, and so on. David Lane, Enchanted Land. Naturally, mastery of Surat Shabad Yoga is not an overnight affair, but involves years of consistent application and struggle. The desired results, adepts in the tradition agree, being largely due to the earnestness and day-to-day -day practice of the seeker. Ascension of the soul through the higher planes, heavens, realms, inner regions, levels.
spheres, the inner ascent. Before the inner voyage of light and sound can begin, the meditator must become adept at withdrawing his or her attention from the world and concentrating one pointedly at the third eye center. Accordingly, when the neophyte has achieved even a modicum of success, having sensations of numbness just up to the solar plexus, flashes of light will begin, will, will begin to manifest. Flashes of light will begin to manifest. At first it appears that the light is coming and going, causing the phenomenon of bright sparks, but in actuality it is the mind which is ascending and descending. The feeling of physical insensibility is one of the most important acid tests to determine if the meditation process is proceeding correctly. Starting in the feet, numbness rises slowly through the lower extremities until the entire body feels like stone. When such a voluntary paralysis occurs, the meditator gravitates more and more to the inner universe than to the outer one. According to the masters, it is the function of Simran to instigate this type of benumbing impression, which releases the mind from its constructing hold on the material corpus. It is at this junction when the meditator senses an intense feeling of upward movement, as if being literally pulled by a magnetic force. This sucking effect is the direct result of one's attention moving inward away from the outer orifices. Though at but a preliminary stage, the student experiences firsthand what it is like to have an out-of-body sensation. With practice, the meditator finally does achieve total out-of-body consciousness, traveling at immense speeds through regions of darkness, not dissimilar in content to reports of clinically dead patients who have been resuscitated. And here he refers to Raymond Moody, Life After Life, Kenneth Ring books on near-death experiences or NDEs and OOBEs, out-of-body experiences. Soul travel. After complete withdrawal from the physical body, the neophyte's capacity for inner sight or nirit and sound, surat, increases tremendously, enabling him or her to see and hear clearly what was only thought before to be a figment of religious imagination. Accompanying this ability is also the realization of a superconscious state of awareness remarkably more vivid and lucid than the ordinary waking state. To understand how such a new degree of consciousness can be awakened, it is important to see how awareness moves through various degrees of clarity. In the waking state, for instance, attention is centered behind the eyes at the back of the head. But after 18 or so hours, we notice a movement downwards and inward from this station towards the throat, culminating in sleep. Likewise, after about 8 hours, we sense a rising upwards to the eyes with the final termination being, of course, our normal everyday consciousness, the waking state. In both of these cases, our common language expresses a graphically simple way of the process of awareness. We fall asleep, we wake up, my eyes are heavy, I feel so awake and high. In yoga psychology, the farther down one's consciousness descends, the deeper the sleep, or unconscious state. The further up it ascends, the higher the awareness, or superconscious. The pattern is quite clear. Clarity increases steadily the more one ascends, not vice versa. Ken Wilbur has beautifully described the spectrum of consciousness as having a definite hierarchical structure with the higher orders subsuming and transcending their lower counterparts. That's a reading from the book Enchanted Land on the Interior Voyage by David Christopher Lane. 
There are several techniques described, the specific details of which are taught to students of Sant Mat, the path of the masters, at the time of their diksha or initiation into the practice. One, developing a daily routine, the habit of meditating at the same time or times each day. Two, proper posture, so that one is truly focused at the third eye and remains alert and awake. Three, manas jap, simran, a mantra, repetition of a sacred word or words, done mentally. Four, manas dhyan, the technique of mentally visualizing the form of God or one's spiritual master. Five, dristi sadhana, the technique of focusing upon an infinitesimal point in inner light meditation, this point will eventually blossom into inner light or visions of light. One gazes into the middle of the darkness or the light one sees, the vision one sees while in meditation. One passes from scene to scene and vision to vision, always looking toward the center, a kind of tunnel, if you will, a tunnel of darkness and light. Six, Nara Sadhana, also called Surat Shabad Yoga, inner sound meditation, the practice of inner spiritual hearing, transcendental hearing. And finally, a less talked about stage, the seventh stage, reaching the state of Kavalya, state or stage of Kavalya, meaning oneness with the Supreme Being in the pure conscious realm. The ultimate goal of Santmat is to merge into the upper level of Kavalya, the state beyond sound, the ultimate reality of God in the Narguna or formless state, also described with terms such as Radhaswami, Lord of the Soul, Anami, the Nameless One, Anadi Parush, the soundless state, and Anurag Sagar, the ocean of love. So, in other words, beyond the lights, beyond the sounds, beyond the planes, there is the One, there is God, who is veiled by light and sound, but is beyond the light and sound, in this absolute state of oneness at the top, the most high state. The method of taking back the spirit entity to its original source is to ride the sound current. The method for taking back the spirit entity is Surat Shabad Yoga, riding the sound current. The method for taking back the spirit entity or soul to its supreme source is first to concentrate at the eye focus, the seat of the soul, the spirit entity and mind which are diffused in our body and in a manner tied to external objects by desires and passions, and next to commence its journey homeward by attending to the internal sound, or in other words, by riding the life or sound current, which has originally emanated from the Supreme Source. The current which has been instrumental in having brought the soul down here must naturally be the path for its return to the original source. And whoever finds this current is on the path of emancipation. This current, which is the spirit and life current, is called in the Radhaswami faith, sound or word or holy name. That's a reading from Prem Patra Radhaswami by Huzur Maharaj Rai Salagram of Agra, another successor and disciple of Swamiji Maharaj on the soul is like a fish riding the current back upstream, you know, back to the, the ocean of God. And that's why the sound current practice is so centrally important. This is also from Hazur Maharaj Rai Salagram from Prem Patra Radhaswami. The ascension of the soul stage by stage to higher regions can be accomplished with the help of Shabad, the sound current. Hearing these sounds, the soul will proceed from one region to another and will ultimately reach the highest region 
and enter into rest. Prem Patra Radhaswami, the love discourses of the Lord of the soul. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. During the second half of today's podcast, and coming up next, the inner regions, astral plane, causal plane, mental plane, the whirling vortex cave known as Banwar Gufa, the dark void and the great dark void of Mahasun, and four spiritual planes above, generally called Sachkan, but divided into four separate regions. The inner regions, the heavens, the spheres of creation, the interior voyage of the soul, back home again. The first inner region, Sahaz Dal Kanwal, the thousand petaled lotus. The first inner region. When your eye turns inwards in the brain and you see the firmament, the heavens within, and your spirit leaves the body and rises upwards, you will see the Akash in which is located the thousand petaled lotus, of which perform the various functions powering and pertaining to the three worlds. Its effulgence will exhilarate your spirit. You will at that stage witness Naringen, the lord of the three worlds. Several religions which attained this stage and took the deity thereof to be the lord of all were duped. Seeing the light and refulgence of this region, they felt satiated their upward progress was stopped. They did not find the guide to the higher regions, hence they could proceed no further. Shiv Dayal Singh, also known as Sant Radhaswami Sahib, also known as Swamiji Maharaj, from the Esoteric Instructions chapter of Sarbachan Radhaswami Poetry, Book One, published in Agra, one of the foundational texts of recent centuries in the Sant Mat tradition, mystic poetry of Swamiji, which has a lot of inner experience included. A bit like Rumi, only more technical, with inner visions and sounds, descriptions of inner regions, the various heavens. Shiv Dayal Singh, Sarbachan Radha Swami poetry. And it sounds rather Gnostic there, doesn't it? It sounds like some in the world religions decided that that was the highest region and said, ah, we've made it. We've made it. That's it. That's all there is. And stopped at that level of the astral plane, not realizing that there is much more beyond and above. Always more, always more beyond, always more above. The ascension of the soul through the higher planes, heavens, realms, inner regions, levels, spheres. The ascension of the soul into interior regions of light and sound. The second inner region, the causal plane, also called Trikuti, the three prominences. At the apex of this Akash in Sahasdal Kanwal, the thousand petaled lotus, there is a passage which is very small, like the eye of a needle. Your surat, your spirit, your soul, should penetrate this eye. Further on, there is Bank Nal, the crooked tunnel, the crooked path, which goes straight and then downwards and then again upwards. Beyond this passage comes a second stage. Trikuti is situated here. It is one lock yojan in length and one lock yojan in width, millions of miles in inner space. 
an expression describing tremendous dimensions. There are numerous varieties of glories and spectacles at that plane, which are difficult to describe. Thousands of suns and moons look pale in comparison to the light there. All the time, the melodious sounds of ong, ong, and hu, hu, and sounds resembling thunder of clouds reverberate there. On obtaining this region, the spirit becomes very happy, blissful, purified and subtle. It is from here onwards that it becomes cognizant of the spiritual regions. Another passage from Shiv Dayal Singh, Swamiji Maharaj, Sarabachan Radha Swami Poetry, Book 1. Saints show us the path of sound and light. They still the mind and raise it to the skies within. The soul gets concentrated at the door and is in bliss. Ascending the celestial skies, she is in sight of Gagan, the mystic sky of the second stage. The fortunate soul sets on its journey along with the divine melody listening to the celestial music day by day she becomes detached that's from a bhajan or hymn of Sant Tulsi Sahib of Hathras the initiating master of Swamiji Maharaj the family guru of Swamiji his whole family and his wife's family as well the ascension of the soul into interior regions of light and sound the third region, Daswan Dwar, and the great dark void. The tenth door, Parbrahm, Sun, the void, and Maha Sun, the great void. The refulgence of this region, Daswan Dwar, is twelve times that of Trikuti. Pure pools of ambrosia called Mansarovar, the lake of nectar, abound here. There are innumerable flowers and gardens. Spirits, like beauties, dance at various places. At every place, fountains of nectar are overflowing and the streams of nectar are gushing out. How may one describe the splendor and decoration of this region? There are platforms of diamonds, beds of emeralds and plants of jewels all studded all studded with rubies and precious stones. Bejeweled fish swimming in pools there display their beauty and ornamentation and their glitter and sheen attract attention. Beyond this, there are innumerable palaces and crystals and mirrors in which spirit entities reside at their respective spots as allocated by the Lord the denizens there are spiritual and free from physical taints. Full particulars of these regions are known only to saints. It is not meant to describe them in greater detail. Shiv Dayal Singh, Sarbachan Radhaswami Poetry. Certain saints report that there are ten passageways in Trikuti, the first nine are local, leading the aspirant only to outlying parts of the second stage. The tenth door, though, opens up into the third region, a dimension beyond mind and matter, appropriately titled Daswan Dwar, Tenth Door. So named because of the key passageway in Trikuti. The third region is exceptionally auspicious since the student leaves the mind plane altogether and realizes for the first time his or her true self as a pure drop of infinite light and love. From Daswan Dwar, the pull is inherently upwards. No longer does Kal's negative power attract the free spirit. Like a butterfly liberated from its inhibiting cocoon, the soul flies forth, unencumbered to its original and true abode. The lord of this region is known as the Detached One, 
and the sound manifests as a sarangi like instrument, stringed instrument, with white light shimmering like diamonds. Daswan Dwar's refulgence is so brilliant that it dims twelvefold the reddish light of Trikuti. Although the sound current is one constant audible life stream, it has four major gradations, unhad or unstruck, sar, essential, sat, true, and nij, original. For instance, in the third region, the shabd transforms from anhad into sar, which is the movement from the mind to the soul current. Progressively, sar shabd leads into sat shabd, which finally ushers in the nij current of the Supreme Lord, who is absolutely beyond all expression. One of the central attractions in the third region is the lake of nectar, the vast pool of immortality, wherein the soul is cleansed of residual samskaras, past impressions, like being baptized. The soul is baptized in the lake of nectar. Elucidate Sawan Singh Ji. When the Sikh gurus built the golden temple of Amritsar at what is now the city of Amritsar, they surrounded it with a pool of water to represent on earth the Mansarovar pool or lake of the third spiritual region. This pool they called Amritsar, which has the same meaning as this heavenly lake of nectar, the pool of nectar of immortality. Consciousness is defined with the drop or bubble, but not yet with the ocean of love in its awesome entirety. Thus the soul must evolve even further to achieve full jiva mukti, liberation while living. The face of the self has become discovered Consciousness beyond body and mind is experienced to be the true reality, but the primordial body of the Absolute remains unattained, says Hazur Baba Sawan Singh. Perhaps the most frightening phase of the meditator's exploration is through the region known as Mahasun, the Great Void, which is located between Daswan Dwar and Banwar Gufa. Though the soul is said to contain the light of twelve suns, its brilliance is blinded by the impenetrable darkness which precedes the fourth region. In fact, saints rarely discuss this stage as it can only be crossed with the help of the inner guide, the inner guru, the inner master outlines Shiv Dayal Singh of this plain, having sojourned there Daswandwar, and having enjoyed the glory thereof for a very long time, the spirit of this fakir proceeded on in accordance with the instruction of the guides. After traversing five Arab, or one thousand million, and seventy-five crore yojans upwards, the spirit entity effected ingress into the bounds of Hahut and witnessed the panorama of that region. There the expanse of ten nil, or one thousand million, is enveloped in darkness. The depth of this dark region cannot be fathomed. The spirit went down one Karab Yojans. Yojans. Still the bottom was nowhere to be found. Then the spirit turned up and proceeded on the path chalked out by the master. It was not considered advisable to go down, uh, to go right down to the bottom of this region. This region is called Mahasun. There are prison cells for the condemned spirits ejected from the court of the true supreme being. Although these spirits are not subjected to any trouble and they perform their functions by their own light, 
Yet, as they do not get the darshan or vision of the Lord, they are restless. However, there is a way for their remission also. Whenever saints happen to pass that way with the spirits reclaimed from the lower regions, some of these spirits fortunately get their darshan. Such spirits go along with the saints who very gladly take them to the court of the Lord and get them pardoned. To cross the abyss without such a guide is impossible, according to the masters, like Shiv Dayal Singh, Swamiji Maharaj, because the ascent is not self-centered, but God-centered, involving the maj, the will, the grace of the Supreme Lord. In a sense, what we are witnessing is the ultimate surrender. First, the physical body has to be given up, sensory paralysis, out-of-body experience, etc. And then the lower and higher mind in the stages of Sahaz Dal Kanwal and Trikuti, and finally the soul itself in such kind, which is nothing but a mere bubble in the ocean of infinity. Above is from Enchanted Land by David Lane, the MSAC philosophy group, talking about Mahasun, Swamiji Maharaj, traversing the great void. Spiritual Awakening Radio, and today a Sant Mat Satsang podcast on the ascension of the soul through the higher planes, the heavens, the inner regions, levels, or spheres. By the way, on this Mahasun collection of verses in the Sarbachan poetry of Swamiji Maharaj, a disciple and spiritual successor of Swamiji Maharaj by the name of Sant Garbdas, in his book Anmol Vajan, does some commentary. He comments on other verses of the Sarbachan too, which I look forward to reading one of these days when we get the whole book of Anmol Vajan published in English. But I have already translated the commentary on these Mahasun verses. Garbda, uh, 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 Sant Garabdas of the Radhaswami faith says, Swamiji in his discourses has said that his surat or soul descended into the dark regions of Mahasun, but could neither locate the bottom nor the end of it, nor did it feel worthwhile to go down any further. Thereafter his surat or soul, adhering to the signs as revealed to him by his gurus, ascended upwards. Here, Swamiji says that it was the inner mercy or grace of his Satguru, Tulsi Sahib, and that of Maharaj Gudhari Das Ji, a successor of Tulsi Sahib, whose satsang he attended for a very long period of time. So here, Garab Das is saying that the two inner masters that guided him through Mahasun was Tulsi Sahib, his initiating guru, as we know, and the successor of Tulsi Sahib that Swamiji was affiliated with during all of those years before he began his own Radha Swami Satsang in 1861. That guru was Gudhari Das, also known as Gudhari Sahib. Both of these as inner radiant forms guided Swamiji through the great dark void of Mahasun. The ascension of the soul from the whirlpool vortex cave to Sachkhand, the ascension of the soul into interior regions of light and sound, the fourth through the eighth heavens, the fourth region, Banwar Gufa, whirling cave vortex. Anahu, I am he in Sufism. Sohan, I am that 
in the Sant tradition. The spirit thereafter went to Hutal Hut, which in Hindi has been described as Banwar Gufa. There is a rotating cave here, which all the time in subtle motion, and the spirits ever swing on it. All around there are innumerable spiritual islands from which the sounds of Sahong, Sahong, and Anahu, Anahu rise all the time. Spirit entities playfully and rapturously enjoy these sounds. Whiffs of scents of various kinds and sweet fragrance of sandal are enjoyed by the spirits there and the melodies of flutes are heard while it proceeds onwards. Other characteristics of this region cannot be reduced to writing as they can be realized by the spirit only when it reaches there after performing meditation practices. Shiv Dayal Singh, Swamiji Maharaj, Sarbachan Radhaswami Poetry. Upon arriving in Banwar Gufa, the soul's nairat, power to see, and surat, capacity to hear, attain a state of satisfaction. The fifth through the eighth regions, Nirvana, Kivalya, Oneness, Sach Khan, the true eternal realm, divided into four subsections. The fifth plane is called Satluk, the true realm. And the fifth plane is the first of these four higher Sachkhand regions. Satlok, true realm, Satnam, true name, Sat Paurush, true original supreme being. The soul remains an individual drop of consciousness at this level. Six, Alak Lok, the invisible realm. Seven, Agam Lok, the inaccessible realm also called nearness, the soul, the drop, can choose to merge into the ocean of God and then revert back to its individual state again. Free will in the heavens. The soul can choose to merge back into God. The drop can merge into the ocean and then decide to become an individualized drop again in this nearness state. And finally, at the top, Anami, nameless realm, also known as Radhaswami Desh, Radhaswami Lok, Radhaswami Dham, the abode of the Lord of the Soul, the Most High Ultimate Reality, the Eighth, Ocean of Love, upper level of Kavalya, beyond the light and sound, the ultimate reality of God in the Most High, formless, soundless state, the Ocean of Love, Anurag Sagar, here the many have returned to the one. At this stage, all the soul drops have flowed back into the ocean of love. On crossing this place, the spirit entity reached the outposts of Satlok, where melodious sounds of Sat, Sat, and Hak, Hak, were heard, as though coming out of a vena which is an Indian musical instrument used in Indian classical rag is a very beautiful instrument. Shiv Dayal Singh, on hearing this, the spirit penetrated further on rapturously. There rose to view the silver and golden streams full of nectar and vast gardens. Each tree thereof is one crore yojans in height and crores of suns and moons hang from them as flowers and fruits, innumerable spirits and hansas, heavenly birds, sing, chatter, and play on those trees like birds. The wondrous beauty of this region is ineffable. While enjoying it, the spirit entered Satlok and came into the presence of Sat Parush. Now she regards the glory of the person of Sat Parush, each hair of his is so brilliant, so luminous, that crores of suns and moons look pale in comparison. How may one describe his eyes, nose, ears, face, hands, and feet? They are all nothing but refulgence. Even to describe them as oceans of light does not give the remotest idea of adequate, adequate 
justice. After witnessing the glory of this region, the spirit proceeded on to Alak Lok and got Darshan of Alak Parush. Thereafter, the spirit entity went on and attained Agam Lok. The spirit entity sojourned there a long time, and on going beyond, it got the darshan or vision in the presence of Radhaswami, that is, Anami Parush, the nameless one, given many names. Anami Parush and merged in him. Radhaswami Dham is boundless, infinite, endless, and immeasurable. It is the Nij, special resting place, the Nij Stan, the special resting place of Sants or Fakirs. That region is the ultimate place of the Sants and all speech and description end here. How, how shall I admire the splendor and luminescence of Alak Parush? Billions and trillions of moons and suns feel humble and humiliated and are put to shame, for they are all surpassed by the glory of Alak Parush and feel disgraced. The Surat soul acquires such a brilliant form there that crores of suns cannot do justice to its beautiful aspect. Then the Surat steps forward and goes to perceive the Agam Lok, the inaccessible sphere. The sheen of the inaccessible Parush is peculiar, wholly distinct, for his brilliance and shine excels the light of trillions of suns. Shivdayal Singh Sarbachan. In summary, one grasps the central sounds of the lower realms and progressively is drawn upwards to the sounds of the higher realms. Ultimately, one reaches the center of the original sound, the essential divine sound, and thereafter attains the ultimate state, the state beyond sound. The yoga of sound, Surat Shabad Yoga meditation, must be practiced in order to attain the nameless state. This is fully elaborated and described in the Upanishads and literature of the Sants, the yoga of sound is the only medium to reach this state, no other. The greatest good is in the attainment of the ultimate state, the nameless state. That's a quote from Maharishi Mehi Paramahans in the book, Philosophy of Liberation. Beyond is the nameless one, Parushanami who is called as indescribable and infinite. None can go there except saints, who have termed it their own original eternal abode. O Lord Swami, Radha Swami, I adore you, for you have revealed to me the mystery. Swamiji Maharaj says, From one step to another, the soul beholds strange things which cannot be described in human language. Every region and everything is utterly beyond words. What beauty and glory, how can I describe them? There is nothing here to convey the idea. I am helpless. Love plays the supreme part. It is all love, so says Radha Swami. It is all love, says Radha Swami. Another reading from Sarbachan Radha Swami Poetry by Swamiji Maharaj. In conclusion today on this podcast dedicated to the ascension of the soul. In conclusion, Kabir says, From the beginning until the ending of time, there is love between thee and me. And how shall such love be extinguished? Kabir says, as the river enters into the ocean, so my heart touches thee.